research topic for the past uh, couple months to year or so has been uh, atmospheric mass density estimation uh, via relative accelerometry. So an outline for this presentation is, I'm just gonna go over an introduction to density estimation and past efforts. Uh, the second topic I'll address is density estimation in the context of the SwarmX mission. Then I'll summarize some of my current progress and preliminary results. And finally, I'll go over some next steps. So introduction to density estimation. Uh, a motivation for, uh, for uh, estimating density in the first place is that imprecise knowledge of atmospheric density and, uh, causes one of the largest sources of uncertainty in orbit determination and prediction. The density itself is influenced by a large number of parameters that vary over time, making real-time estimation and future predictions particularly difficult. Uh, and then, Recently, uh, the miniaturization of space systems and formation flying missions with small spacecraft have shown to achieve science object uh, objectives that single spacecraft alone could not. And the goal of my project is to leverage a formation flying mission to get better estimates of atmospheric density in a novel way. And the ultimate goal is to achieve like 1% accuracy for density estimation which is pretty ambitious. And there's multiple missions right now that are striving for this, but even 10% accuracy at this stage would be good. So density estimation is pretty difficult. It has low observ observability over short time intervals due to the relatively small contribution of drag to the overall dynamics. While it is a significant perturbation in LEO, the dominant dynamics are still driven by gravity. And Initial estimates and models of ballistic coefficients and density are imprecise, and the terms appear as a product. So you were at the ballistic coefficient B and the atmospheric density rho contributing to the drag perturbation F. And both uh, B and rho are relatively imprecise. For the ballistic coefficient, we'll know the area of the spacecraft, or like cross-sectional area relative to the flow pretty precisely from attitude determination. And we'll also know its mass, but the drag coefficient is really hard to model. It's a function of the geometry of the spacecraft, material properties, and even atmospheric composition because of the interactions of molecules with the surface of the spacecraft. And another difficulty is modeling the spacecraft velocity relative to the atmosphere. Even if we hold the attitude of the spacecraft constant, since to the first order, the atmosphere uh, co-rotates with the Earth. As we orbit around the Earth, uh, the relative flow velocity will change res with respect to the attitude of the spacecraft. And also, a lot of times we neglect the inclusion of winds. Like we assume that the atmosphere co-rotates with the Earth, but if there's considerable like upper atmospheric winds, any estimate we get could be uh, potentially biased. Another difficulty is that it changes, the density changes substantially over the course of an orbit. Uh, due to like, atmospheric heating from the sun, there's gonna be a bulge in the atmosphere. So as we dip through that bulge, uh, the density is gonna increase periodically. And the density on any given day is a function of the geomagnetic activity and solar activity. So the density models are usually parameterized in terms of these indices that are published uh, mostly daily, but some of them are published every three hours. And finally, only the local density affects the spacecraft's dynamics. So if we're using a single spacecraft, in real time, we can at best estimate the local density. If we look at spacecraft data over a long period of time, we can develop better uh, corrections to global density models, but in real time, it constructs up, it places like a restriction on what we can estimate a lot of the time. And as a motivation to how uh, inaccuracies in density model have been compensated in the past, I'll first uh, just introduce dynamic model compensation, which is a similar procedure just to serve as motivation. So a lot of times DMC is used to account for unmodeled or unknown accelerations. 
within a uh, navigation filter. And so with DMC, the state that we want to estimate is augmented with empirical accelerations, usually expressed in the RTN frame of the satellite. And we estimate these accelerations in addition to the position and velocity of the spacecraft. And these are typically modeled as a first order gauss Markov process. So one of the, the accelerations are an exponential decay plus some process noise. So over time, uh, so and tau is this correlation time. And as time increases, the rate of change of the empirical acceleration uh, goes to zero. And, but during that decay, it's subject to some process noise. So that can uh, kind of correct for these unmodeled accelerations before the empirical acceleration stops changing with time. And we can use a very similar process for bias modeling uh, for force model parameters. If we include additional forces in our filter dynamics model, uh, we can get a high fidelity model in our uh, filter, expect, expect less process noise and high, better results. But the problem is forces such as drag and solar radiation pressure are subject to modeling error because the use of coefficients like the ballistic coefficient that we don't know exactly ahead of time. And specifically in the case of density, our density models also aren't perfect. So we can put like an additive bias on the density, but this is more commonly written as a multiplicative correction. So we say the true density is like a density times one plus this multiplicative correction. Within a navigation filter, we can assume that the true density is equal to a model density uh, denoted with a tilde. And we multiply that by one plus the, the multiplicative correction. And this multiplicative correction is what we estimate is an additional state parameter that we estimate within our filter. So it's tip, so similar to how we augmented the state in the filter with empirical accelerations in the previous example, here we augment the state with the multiplicative density correction. And we also use a first order Gauss-Markov process to model its evolution. And this is a basic approach that has been done in the past. And uh, Wright and Woodburn also simultaneously estimated the ballistic coefficient or a correction to the ballistic coefficient. And earlier I mentioned that estimate or estimating the two directly can be complicated because since they appear as a product, if like any uncertainty in one parameter can be translated into the uncertainty in other. So if we say that we know density really well, then we probably have a worse estimate of the ballistic coefficient. But by uh, estimating these multiplicative corrections to both, um, they were able to achieve better observability of both simultaneously. And they used, and the way they decorrelated the two from one another was to use uh, that tau parameter, they used uh, different correlation times to decorrelate them in time. Uh, and recently there was a thesis in a lot of papers by Ray, and a lot of his work was uh, centered on using Fourier series based expansion models of drag coefficient. So pretty much modeling track coefficient uh, in terms of Fourier coefficients. And it was also a function of attitude and other parameters. And the motivation behind this was that higher fidelity estimates of drag coefficients are required to better resolve the atmospheric density, again, because they appear as this product. And uh, acceler accelerometer-based methods using flight data have been used in the past from like, there's a lot of data from the Champ and Grace missions, and these can be used to obtain like unmodeled accelerations directly and extract a density estimate from that. And these methods are all suited better for uh, local density estimation. So estimating the density at a specific spacecraft location. There have also been uh, investigations into global density estimation. A paper from 2010 by Hinks uh, used a spline-based parameterization. So they, they took a modeled like density from, I think this was the NRLM model and they fit spline parameters to the model as an a priori initial condition. And then they ran a filter with, I think, 100 satellites in a constellation. And 
the state was augmented with the spline fit parameters. So those were allowed to vary over time when, as the density changed. And more recent uh, work is uh, from real time uh, estimation using reduced order modeling. And this case, all the, like the dynamics due to density were parameterized in terms of reduced order modeling. And here I have a representative picture because later in, when I talk about SwarmX, they use three satellites just to show the level of precision that could be achieved. So over a short time span of four hours, they got density estimates to within at worst 20% accuracy. And then if, we, if they ran the filter longer, um, it was hovered around 10% accuracy. But these also used spacecraft orbits that were uh, very different and like widely distributed, which will not be the case in the SwarmX mission. Finally, uh, another global density estimation uh, was based on the Harris Priester density model. And this model uses tabulations of minimum and maximum densities and an interpolation between them based on the geodetic altitude of the spacecraft. And what this paper did is they used a single spherical spacecraft. So it had a pretty precise knowledge of the ballistic coefficient ahead of time. And it estimated minimum and maximum bounds at two separate altitudes uh, to piece together a density estimate. And this used a uh, least squares estimation method. So in terms of my research, so what I'm trying to achieve, my problem statement was to achieve real-time, high-precision, simultaneous estimates of atmospheric mass density corrections and ballistic coefficients leveraging precise knowledge of spacecraft relative motion. So a lot of the motivation behind this is uh, in the context of the SwarmX mission. Uh, this mission will have uh, three, three U CubeSats at an orbit of around like 400 to 500 kilometers. There's some science experiments and science goals. And in that case, the separation between the spacecraft will range from 100 to 1300 kilometers. And they'll be estimating or investigating some uh, atmospheric sciences. And then there will also be some orbital GNC experiments at much closer separations. And Matthew in our lab is working on this hybrid propulsive differential drag control. Included on the SwarmX spacecraft are a 5 sensor. And I use this later to augment some of uh, the measurements I receive because this measures uh, atomic oxygen number density. And at the SwarmX altitude, so near 500 kilometers, atomic oxygen makes up the majority of the atmosphere. So this measurement is a really close proxy to the actual atmospheric density. So that can aid our filter performance. And this measurement uh, models developed from just how most of the density models uh, work. So they usually estimate uh, or determine the, num the number densities of atmospheric components taking into account like the various things I discussed earlier. So spacecraft position, sun position, solar activity, geomagnetic activity. And once the number densities are known, uh, the total mass density is computed as uh, a sum of the, the number densities, the molecular mass of the component and divided by Avogadro's number. And so each of the individual densities are computed and then added together. If we apply the multiplicative correction to this model density, uh, we can note that the number density itself can be modeled in terms of this multiplicative correction. So for a measurement model, we have a number density measured by the FIPEX sensor. Uh, we can get another, we can get the modeled oxygen number density from an atmospheric model such as NRLM because it also outputs those parameters. And then finally, we have this uh, multiplicative correction that's estimated by our filter. So now I'll go into current progress and preliminary results. And while my goal is to use relative dynamics, eventually these preliminary results just use absolute dynamics of a single spacecraft. And it kind of 
exposes some of the weaknesses of that approach as well. So as an aside in this process, I made a toolbox for orbit determination to just aid rapid development and testing of various filters. And I made it compatible with uh, this numerical approximation method that I'll cover briefly. It includes most of the stuff that S cubed does, so uh, higher, higher order gravity atmospheric drag. And I included a lot of different density models so I could experiment with those. Um, and it also includes analytical derivatives of all the force models and GPS signal simulation, some basic uh, filters. And it also allows for uh, sort of automatic discretization and linearization. So in case I want to test out at EKF, I can do that just with a high precision numerical uh, method. And this complex step approximation, uh, some of you may have seen it in some courses, but it's a better or it's a more accurate approximation method for derivatives that yield results accurate to within double precision. Uh, and it works by uh, taking the imaginary part of this function evaluation at this complex step, IH, and has similar computational effort in comparison to central difference approximation because this has two function evaluations. But here, like when you evaluate a function at a complex input, there's usually uh, multiple function evaluations involved within that single computation. And I quickly validated this for orbit determination to make sure it would work for the stuff I was trying to do. So I tested the analytical versus numerical Jacobians for all the perturbing forces. And my main concern was higher order gravity since there were a lot of small numbers involved in a recursive computation. And uh, the maximum error I got was on the order of 10 to the minus 22 in any of the elements. And if you look at, here's just a printout of some of the Jacobians. So uh, at worst, you'll have a little error in the last element. So with that out of the way, I moved on to uh, basic estimation. So using some of the older procedures, in this case, my state included the multiplicative density correction and then a clock bias for, and a clock bias drift rate uh, since I was using GPS measurements. So my measurement vector was a series of eight pseudo ranges and eight pseudo range rates. So these were just from the eight closest GPS satellites. And for the ground truth and filter dynamics, as I was testing this out, I just chose very simple models. Um, and pretty much everything was the same across the two. The only thing that was different was in the ground, ground truth dynamics. I just set this D row by row or this correction factor equal to five and put it as a constant. So every time inside of the, in the ground truth simulation, that was a constant uh, multiplicative factor. And then my goal was, with the filter was to uh, estimate that multiplicative factor. So ideally it would have been five, just a constant five. And here's a plot of the error obtained by the filter. So it gets, so the error gets relatively close to zero, but it has rather large uh, covariance bounds. So even the plus or minus one sigma is uh, plus or minus three. So in this case, the true value was five. So if I had minus three error, then it would be about two. But in a lot of the previous work too, in the published papers, when they had, uh, that when the true offset was smaller, so like say 0.5, they still had similarly large covariance bounds. And often the error was actually negative, which led to better orbit determination results in those papers, but it was yielding a negative density, which isn't really physical. So then I uh, moved on to using uh, density estimation with a 5 pec sensor as well. So pretty much everything remained the same, but I also added uh, this uh, proxy essentially for the density. So this atomic oxygen number density uh, that was obtained by the 5 pec sensor. And again, like I could obtain the modeled um, number oxygen or number the oxygen number density using NRLM. And then I estimated this multiplicative correction. And with this, as expected, it was much 
a smaller error because that number density essentially served as a proxy for the true density. But there's just based on the noise of the sensor, there was still quite a bit of variance. So in this case, plus or minus 0.35 represents less than 10% of the, uh, or it's like an error within 10% of the true result. But again, I was using a multiplicative correction of, or the ground truth user correction of D row by row equals five, which is rather large. And in the cases that the true density and model density only vary by 0.1, um, this is still, too large of an uncertainty because if we had 0.36 but the true offset was 0.1 then again we could run into the issue of having potentially negative uh, densities and another thing to note is just there was a like a pretty strong periodic pattern in the covariance and this was directly linked uh, to the variation in the density so when we had a higher density, for example, at one hour, we had a lower covariance because uh, just like the relative dynamics are more observable when, or the dynamics are more observable due to drag when there's a higher density. And in terms of next steps, uh, in both cases, the multiplicative density corrections improved the ECS state estimates as well. So I didn't show those here, but it tied in the bounds and. Uh, reduce the error in the ECI states. So it also serves as an improvement to the orbit determination process. Um, but short-term estimation is difficult using dynamics of uh, using the, the dynamics of the absolute state of a single satellite. So when I didn't include the five pec sensor, it was particularly problematic and it required a lot of tuning to get it to work well. And Sort of as an next step, so long-term estimation would be possible with mean orbital elements. So over a long period of time, the mean semi-major axis will decay substantially, but at the same time, density can change substantially even over the course of the day. So we could get correction to the atmospheric density over a long period of time, but the true correction at a single incident in time might be different than just a correction we derive for the density over time. And we can see the issue with absolute dynamics on the plot to the left. So we can see that the, the semi-major axis is decaying slowly. So uh, like if you look at the dotted lines, the max and min start decreasing. But uh, even if I said the eccentricity for this was 0 0.001, even if I said to zero, there's still some oscillation. But then if we have close separation between the spacecraft, um, then the relative semi-major axis uh, is more like more like a straight line, and we could potentially extract uh, better estimates by leveraging the relative dynamics instead. And this used uh, difference in so the red line used a ballistic coefficient where one of the spacecraft had a cross-sectional area that was nine times higher than the other, and then this is if the relative ballistic coefficient was just zero, so they were subject to the same drag. And in the case that we assign the spacecraft to have a set attitude and similar surface geometry in those attitudes, we can approximately know the ballistic coefficient to within some uncertainty, assume some a priori value for the ballistic coefficient of the chief, and then estimate a uh, offset or this correction factor only uh, for the chief spacecraft. And the advantage of this uh, would be to only have to uh, estimate one quantity, so the single correction, and then assume that uh, the ballistic coefficient of the, of the deputy is just offset from the ballistic coefficient of the chief by this uh, uh, differential ballistic coefficient. And this would also lead to the simultaneous estimation of ballistic coefficient and density with and without uh, a five pack sensor. So the FIPEC sensor let us get better measurements, but the ultimate goal is to achieve this just with relative accelerometry. Um, another thing I wanna investigate is using the harris Priester model corrections that I mentioned earlier during one of the literature review section. And that was done in uh, least squares estimation setting. And so it doesn't really 
have statistical analysis besides just them comparing it to whatever they set the ground truth to. And when they were running their simulations, they assumed that the ground truth was also used the Harris Priester model just with some constant offset. So they were able to get really accurate results, but didn't really show how accurate those results would be if they were trying to fit the Harris Priester model to another uh, density model. And I want to run some sensitivity and observability analyses. So uh, with the absolute dynamics, the dynamics weren't very sensitive to small changes in density and using different state parameterizations like relative orbital elements or orbital elements might uh, produce better uh, sensitivity uh, to the force model parameters or like these multiplicative density corrections. And there, we could also leverage precise knowledge of relative dynamics from uh, differential GNSS. So Vince, uh, who just graduated recently, did a lot of work with digital where he got relative positioning and relative velocity estimates uh, at the millimeter level. And if we have a strong correlation between the drift of like relative semi-major axis due to atmospheric drag, and we have really precise estimates of that, uh, of the relative positioning, then we could likely get much better estimates of the density corrections. And finally, we could potentially use a 5x sensor again to improve the simultaneous estimation of ballistic coefficient. So we could use it to get an initial estimate of a ballistic coefficient, and that would have some uncertainty associated with it. And for the rest of the estimation process, instead of trying to do the simultaneous estimation, uh, we could treat the ballistic coefficient as a considered parameter that has some variance, but not update its value with any dynamics and use a consider Kalman filter. And I'll leave it open to questions now.